Good morning. Thank you, Brass, for playing. It's kind of fun to hear uh, something different today, isn't it? So uh, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements, and i got to check to see what they are. Um, our VBS this summer, obviously we're not doing it in person, but it is virtual. It's online. There's a sign-up sheet, or you can grab materials and do stuff in the back And if you look at it. Uh, we already have a bunch of people signed up and have started the program. Um, you can do the same thing. Uh, I know there's a way to post things along uh, online and stuff too, and that and then that can explain to you. I don't, I don't know. So please do take a look though and be a part of that as well. It's a great opportunity uh, to have VBS in, in a slightly different way. I also ask on the back of your uh, announcement page, you notice we do have the sign-in sheets. Um, we're not passing the books, so, so we're trying to get back to some sense of normalcy, even though we can't do a lot, right? Uh, please, do try to sign that in, and you can drop it off either when you drop off your offerings, or you can drop it in the church office, or if you want to, hand it to one of the pastors or something. We'll get it in there then, okay? Those are my announcements, so again, we greet each other, and then fat, fat, fun new way, everybody wave.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We maintain a moment of silence for reflection on God's word and self-examination. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, Father in heaven, have mercy upon us. Oh, God. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your mighty, almighty power above all in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant us such a measure of your grace that we may obtain your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 7. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah, who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I'll let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say, We are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistles from Romans, chapter 9. St. Paul writes, What shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained it that is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For our being ignorance of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We read together. When Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. 
And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And as he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
the name of Jesus, amen. In our Old Testament reading today, Jeremiah warns about the destruction of Jerusalem. God will destroy the city because of their sins. But it doesn't have to be this way. If only they would repent, they would live. And in our gospel reading, 600 years later, Jesus says the same. He warns that Jerusalem will be destroyed again. In tears, he cries out, would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace. What's he talking about? What would make for peace? Well, Jeremiah tells us repentance and forgiveness. Repent, and you will have peace with God. For God delights not in the death of the wicked, but that sinners would repent and live. But here's a slightly different answer. What would make for peace? Jesus. Jesus is our peace. His suffering, death, and resurrection. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, rejoice this day. For you of all people, you know this peace. You know the way that makes for peace. You know to confess your sins and to seek the mercy and the forgiveness of Christ. But these people in Jerusalem, they could not see it. And so Jesus weeps for them. If only they had known the time of their visitation. The angels announced it at his birth. Not too far from Jerusalem. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. He came into the world to make peace, but his own people did not receive him. So Jesus weeps for them. He weeps for the Jews, as Paul does in our epistle. Jesus weeps for Jerusalem, and more specifically, he weeps for all who are unrepentant, for he desires all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. But Jesus is also a just judge. And in the end, he will destroy sin. Indeed, all sin that isn't covered up by Christ, that isn't covered by his righteousness, will be destroyed. Christians, we are marked by the blood of the Lamb. We have the Passover blood upon us. And therefore, we will be spared when the wrath comes. But as for those without the blood, without faith in Jesus, well, there's nothing left to save them, for they have rejected the only way to life. It's like a starving man who refuses to eat. It's like a drowning man who doesn't want rescued. It's like a sick man who spits out life-saving medicine. It's like a man high up in a tree who's sawing off the limb he is sitting upon. To reject Jesus is to reject the only hope for survival. And it means death. And Jesus knows it. And so he weeps. For 37 years later, God would use a Roman army to flatten the city. And after that, a far worse punishment would follow. If only they had known the way that makes for peace. Still, even when we understand why God had to punish them, still, this is all quite shocking to us. First, it's shocking because we spend so much time focusing on God's mercy that his justice is surprising. But specifically with Jerusalem, with Jerusalem, it's shocking 
because these are the Jews, the people of Abraham, God's people, the people he rescued from Egypt with signs and wonders, his treasured possession. These are his kinsmen according to the flesh. And this city is God's city. To destroy Jerusalem is to destroy God's hometown. To destroy the temple is to destroy his own house. I mean, who burns down his own town and his own house? Well, I think God is showing us in this painful way that no one, and I mean no one, will be spared if they are outside of Christ. Christ is the only way, the only truth, the only life. And to prove to us that he will punish all without faith, all outside of Jesus, he destroys even this city, a city that would seem like the exception to the rule. But if even Jerusalem will not be spared, then nothing outside of Christ will be spared. If even they were punished, there is no salvation outside of Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So it is clear today that God will punish sin. But here's another thing to consider today. Why wait? Why wait to punish? You see, after Jerusalem rejected Jesus, God waited for 37 years to punish them. So why is there a delay? I mean, it causes a problem, does it not? Not only in this case, but in every case. Because God waits to punish sin, sinners tend to think they got away with it. For example, a man cheats on his wife, and when he doesn't get zapped, when there's no lightning bolt from heaven, he thinks, huh, got away with it. Guess I can move on with my life. So there's a problem in delaying punishment. It gives sinners the impression that there will be no reckoning. So why wait? Well, St. Peter tells us it's because God is patient. He is patient, not wishing that any would perish, but that all would reach repentance. Consider this. Consider what would happen if God would have zapped King David after he slept with Bathsheba. We might not see David in eternity, but God showed extreme patience with David, and through Nathan, David was restored. Likewise, if God had punished Paul for persecuting Christians, we would not have a brother in Paul. But God waited and brought him to faith. And in these men, God has demonstrated his extreme patience and mercy for sinners. And likewise, even after Jerusalem rejected Jesus, do you know what God did during those 37 years? He sent them apostles to preach the message of forgiveness. And on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 in that city repented and were baptized and were saved. They found the way of peace. And then later, many more from that city, for the book of Acts tells us that God added to their number daily those who were being saved. And the same is true for us. God doesn't zap us when we fall into sin because he loves even his enemies and he wishes for our repentance. Friends, perhaps there are some people even here in this room who are living in sin. And what I mean by that is living in complete defiance to the clear word of God. And maybe up until now, you've ignored the warnings. Perhaps you've refused to even acknowledge that it is a sin. So why hasn't God punished you yet? Because he has compassion. Because he would much rather forgive you. Because he's patient, 
hoping to spare you from his wrath by the blood of the Lamb. But do not be like the people in Jeremiah's day who thought that they were forgiven while continuing right back into sin. Do not embrace your sin and then say, oh, I am delivered, I am delivered. No. For truly, I tell you, if you are planning on remaining in your sin, that is, if it's your intention to leave this place and go right back to it, to keep on keeping on in that sin, if you have no desire, no desire to amend your sinful ways by the power of the Holy Spirit, well, then you should expect only punishment. And these stories of wrath are pictures of your future. But on the other hand, if you hate what you've done, if you confess your sin, if you know that you're a poor, miserable sinner, Friend, God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So all this stuff today about Jerusalem's destruction, this is not a history lesson. It was written down for you upon whom the end of the ages has come. This was written down as a warning for you. Seeing their punishment God hopes to spare you from the same. He has made them an example that you might not do evil as they did. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, this isn't just information. This is Jesus begging you today to know the way of peace, to know that he is our peace. For unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. But friends, I am also confident that most of you came here today because you do know the way of peace. You know Christ and him crucified for you. You know the Passover lamb whose blood has marked you and who makes death pass over you. You know about sins forgiven, and about how you will be spared from the wrath to come, because you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In just a few minutes, we who fear the Lord will gather again at his table, and here he will declare his peace upon you. Indeed, right after the words of institution, the pastor always points to the elements and says, the peace of the Lord be with you always. For right here, we find peace. Peace in the flesh of Christ, always in Jesus. Peace in his body. Peace in his blood, given for you, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Therefore, you who fear the Lord, come. Come and receive his peace. Amen. Please rise for prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you indeed would grant to us to work repentance in our hearts, that by your mercies we might see our sin, confess it before uh, you, and to receive from you the forgiveness of sins. We pray that our pride would not get in the way, but rather that by your goodness we might indeed see us for what we are, but even more importantly, see you for whom you are, the God who gave us his only begotten Son, that we might live forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would walk with mercy upon us here at St. John. We pray that you would grant to us your peace and your grace, that we'd ever be a people who, who desire your word and gather around it, who want to see that word spread in our communities. 
We pray, especially for the families of St. John this week, the Giannetti family, the Giasone family, the Gilbert family, the Gonzalez family, and for James and Nora Gorman, that they might always know your love and grace and compassion in Jesus, and that they might desire above all else to spread that name of Christ now so that they might live with you eternally. We pray for the persecuted church throughout the world, that in your goodness, those who are suffering for the sake of Christ might find the strength to continue to walk steadfast and that your spirit would lead them into all truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would look over those who are sick and ill of this congregation, that you be with Margaret and Ruth and Don and Jim and Ron and Annalise and Ron, and that by your goodness they might grow in faith and love, and that in the midst of their suffering they may look to you for help, not just for healing, but that they might find the peace that passes understanding. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would grant your spirit of all comfort to those who mourn, especially to Anne Ebel and her family as they mourn the death of her mother. We pray that they would take hope in the promises of resurrection to eternal life for those who have died in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace and justice and harmony in this nation. For peace without justice is just a dream. But we pray that for your goodness, that people would forgive one another, that they would live repentant lives where harm has been done, and that by your goodness, peace and justice and harmony may rule in this country, that all might get the opportunity to hear the love of Christ in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of our nation, that you would guide them and guard them and protect them, that you grant to them good counsel and them the wisdom to heed it, that you would be at the leaders of our state, and that grant that they might too have wisdom and understanding, and that they might always do what is right and just and seek the good of all, and not political leanings in this time. We pray for the leaders of our church body, for President Harrison and President Meyer, that you might grant to them a faithful spirit and that they might lead us into a true confession of faith and a true walk and faithful walk in your word. For the leaders of this congregation, pastoral and lay alike, that we may always love your word and seek to, to be faithful in our practice, that others might know Christ and rejoice in the gifts you have given. Lord, in your mercy, for the city of Detroit and those of us in her suburbs, that there might not only be peace and harmony and justice, but you might provide jobs in abundance, that all who need work might be able to have it, and they might provide for their families and those others near them who are in need and need their help. Lord, in your mercy. Father, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we invite you forward to please uh, bring your offerings to our Lord at this time. You may be seated.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the continued blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had to mercy in us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout the days of our pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.